Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And welcome to another episode in the Cross Question. And we have been looking in this series whether or not the crucifixion as we found in the Bible is actually provable or acceptable or should we just have a look at another version? Perhaps we should look at what the actual Quran teaches and what Islam teaches about the crucifixion. At the moment, we have got to the point where the trial by the Jews is about to take place. And last week, we began to look at Mark chapter 14 from verse 53. Mark chapter 14, verse 53, it says, Then they led Jesus away to the high priest's house, where the chief priests and elders and doctors of the law were all gathered together or assembling. Now, Peter followed him from a distance. This is talking about who did he follow? He followed Jesus right into the high priest's courtyard where they were all gathered. And there he remained sitting amongst those who had attended, warming himself with the fire that was there. So if we look at this story, there's two things we have to ask ourselves. One, what was he doing in the high priest's courtyard? How did he get access to it? Did he have a VIP card? Did he have very influential friends? Uh, we don't know that Peter was anybody. I mean, he was just a nobody as far as we understand from Jesus choosing him to be one of the disciples. He wasn't influential. He wasn't a business person. He, wasn't, he didn't have any contact. So how did he get into the courtyard? Nobody knows. Secondly, we find that the first time we know what type of weather it is in the Bible, the first time we're actually told anything about the weather, because we know it must have been very, very cold at that time of the year, because we see that he immediately, when he gets there, he goes around the fireplace. Now, if you're trying to be inconspicuous, if you're trying to hide in the background, like it says, I mean, if we read verse 53, it says, Peter followed him from a distance, hiding. So we know he doesn't want anyone to recognize or see him. You would not go to a raging fire and stand in front of the fire if you didn't want people to recognize you, unless it was extremely cold. The only thing that would have forced you to go and stand in front of the fire is if you were cold. And so he must have gone and stood in front of that fire to warm himself, not really worried, more worried about warming himself up than worried about being identified. So it must have been a very cold night in that April. So Peter would be sitting near this fire warming himself while Jesus, his master, was just a few meters away, or maybe not a few meters. We don't actually know how far he was away but he was being trialed at, tried at the time while Peter is warming himself up at this fire. But it's very interesting that in the same book, just a few verses ago, in fact, we were talking about perhaps a half an hour ago. Half an hour ago, there was a young man who was with them in Gethsemane who was wearing nothing but a loincloth around his waist. And when the soldiers tried to grab hold of him as well, he ran off. Uh, they grabbed hold of his loincloth, which is just like a towel around his waist, and he ran off into the night naked. So it's very odd because it's so cold that Peter is willing to expose himself, be arrested as well as being one of those who are with Jesus, because it's so cold he stands around the fire. Yet only a half an hour ago, there was one of the guys that was with him, one of the young boys, in fact it says young man, was with him, who had nothing on but a loincloth and runs off into the night. So it's one or the other. So one of the stories is true, one of the stories is not true. We don't know how it happened. So already we can see this is nonsense. Somebody is not telling the truth. Out of the scribes who are writing is not telling the truth. Maybe the translators misunderstood and translated it wrong. Or the story is made up, one of the stories is made up one or the other. They can't both be true at the same time. Extremely impossible or extremely unlikely. In fact, it's not even unlikely, it's not possible. So... Let's move on with the story. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 58, it places Peter into the high priest's courtyard, meaning, in other words, he was there to be able to see everything that was going to take place right to the end. In fact, the exact words that are mentioned in Matthew chapter 26, verse 58 says, meaning to see all things to its end. Now, it does not mention in Luke chapter 22, verse 55, that there was a fire. But Luke says that they lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter sat amongst them. So it doesn't talk about a huge bonfire or anything. It just says, then they lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter sat amongst them. So he's not up front and center. But this is the story that we have so far. 
But John's story is more elaborate. Of course, he can't just have something simple like that. He has to go into more detail. He has to name, claim it, and frame it, if you want to put it that way. So in his story, in John chapter 18, read from about verse 12 onwards, where the story goes, the troops with their commanders and the Jewish police now arrested Jesus and they secured him. In other words, they must have tied him up, handcuffed him. Maybe they grabbed hold of him, whatever it is. And they took him first to the house of Annas, one of the people of the area that they were going to speak to. From this point of view, the story becomes very confusing between the various manuscripts, which should have made it very simple to understand. But we find that there is a great deal of confusion in the various manuscripts, which we will end up discussing a little bit later, inshallah, when we get time. So when they take him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who had advised the Jews before they had taken control of him, that it was in their own interest to take one man to die for their whole people, than to let the whole Jewish nation suffer. Because remember, they said that the teachings that Jesus was teaching, the actions that he was doing, may cause an uprising. It may cause the Jewish people to uprise and revolt against the Romans. And then the Romans would take it out on the Jewish people. They would come and destroy their temples and maybe even close their temples. So it would be more advisable if they just arrested Jesus, hand him over, let him be killed or whatever. The rest of the people wouldn't have to suffer. So John's version, he does not put Peter following Jesus alone. He has other disciples with him. So he doesn't have Peter lurking in the background, trying to hide, get into the courtyard with his VIP ticket, standing by the fire. No, John's version, he must have other disciples with him as well. And so in John's version, we have this other or some other disciple. Sometimes we hear the word other. Sometimes it's written the other disciple. Appearing later a number of times, supposedly coming in and out of the scene. Now, remember when we looked earlier in a few episodes back, we spoke that John often spoke about himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's more than likely that John is trying to attempt to write himself into the scene as well. And again, trying to downplay Peter's involvement in the whole story. Matthew, Mark, and Luke probably writing before the influence of Paul. John writing after the influence of Paul suddenly needs to write himself into the scene because he needs to correct any doctrinal mistakes that Paul might make during his captivity. So what he does, is he talks about himself, but instead of saying John, because he's already written about himself being the disciple whom Jesus loved. So he doesn't want to overdo it and push himself front and center too much. So he brings himself slowly into the scene. And so what he does is he calls himself the other, or the sometimes it's written, the other disciple. And appears later a number of times in the scene, supposedly to make himself somebody whom Jesus loved, or somebody whom would have some type of influence on what was going to take place in the rest of the scene. So it happens that this other disciple or other had connections with the high priest as well. So it wasn't only Peter who got his VIP ticket into the Golden Circle arena, but somehow he was also able to get his ticket and maybe he had an acquaintance, even maybe himself was connected or friendly with the high priest. So by writing himself into the scene, he shows that he is connected in high places. He uses his acquaintance to get Peter maybe into the courtyard with him. So instead of just Peter who managed to get in, here we have John getting into the courtyard, getting into this area, and he brings Peter with him. So this is his credentials. So this is what we have. But John makes so many mistakes as we've already come across throughout this series so far. So in John chapter 18, verse 18, he makes this fatal error. The servants and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and were standing around it warming themselves. So Peter too was standing there sharing the warmth. So this is what we find in John chapter 18, verse 18. Now, I don't know if any of you picked up the fatal error here, but if you didn't pick it up, I'll read it again. And if you didn't pick it up, well, I'll mention what it is later. It says in John chapter 18, verse 18, the servants and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was very cold, or some say just cold. 
and they were standing around warming themselves and Peter too was standing there with them sharing the warmth. So while John identifies the fire as a charcoal fire and everyone including Peter warming themselves standing, the other Gospels tell us that the people were sitting around a fire. So John was writing from Ephesus. We know for a fact that he is writing in Ephesus. Ephesus gets very cold. And he was probably sitting beside his little warm fireplace inside his small little room, perhaps not realizing that those people that were in the courtyard that day were probably a large group of people. Okay, let's make it not even a large group of people. Let's say there were only 10 people trying to warm themselves in a more or less difficulty because they are trying to find themselves warming themselves. If it, say this was the table, and this table was filled with charcoal, and maybe even you made it 10 times the size of it is now, and there were 10 of us trying to keep ourselves warm around a charcoal fire, we would find it extremely difficult. So John writing from colder Ephesus where he's standing beside, maybe he's sitting like I am now, writing his book next to a charcoal fire, of course it's going to give him warmth because he's got a room to keep the warm up the whole room. But any of you have had a barbecue, or in South Africa we call it a braai, if you stand around a braai, you're basically, when you want to cook meat on a barbecue or a braai, how do you know when the coals are ready to cook? You put your hand above the grill, and you go one, two, three, and then if it gets too hot and you have to pull your hand away, it's now ready. If you go one, oh, it's too hot. If you go one, two, still too hot. You have to wait until about three or four count. Even if you wait for a one count and it's very, very, very hot, you cannot warm yourself by a charcoal fire. And definitely not a crowd of people could warm themselves by a charcoal fire. So the inspired word of God, the words coming directly from God supposedly, was unable to understand that a charcoal fire does not warm people, especially 10 or 20 people or a large group of people, let alone one people. So the accounts differ to what actually happened at this event, but we know that for sure he made a fatal error that it could not possibly be a charcoal fire unless it was a gigantic charcoal fire, but we know it wasn't because the account said that they lit a fire. So it means he just got there when they started to light the fire and the charcoal or the embers that they burnt would have not been a raging huge massive fire. Also the time period that was done, which we'll look at later, also gives the impression that the fire had been lit long before and all that was remaining was a bit of the coal, if you follow John's version. Now Mark has the chief priests, elders, and doctors of the law already assembled waiting for the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, to appear. And that's where we will continue after we get back from this break, inshallah. Oh Allah, say He is Allah one and only. Allah, the absolute and eternal. He begets not, nor is He begotten. There is nothing like Him. Focus on the source of wisdom. The Quran is a magnet. The Sunnah is a revelation. Islam had the solution right from the beginning. We apply that and the problem is solved. Focus on the solution for our world. There is no man on the face of earth. His life was narrated to us like Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Poor, rich, white, black, Arab, non-Arab. Everybody say the same word. Obey Allah. Obey the messenger. Focus on the Akhirah. Tawbah is mandatory upon each and every Muslim. Success for the Muslim is having the correct belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has power of all things. Has power of all things. Focus on the facts and realities that motivate the world towards Islam. In Islam in Focus, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah rahman rahim Welcome back. We are continuing with the story of the cross question. And we're getting to the point now where the disciples writing different versions of what happened when Jesus is taken to be tried. And we said before the break that John 
according to his version, all the people are gathered around a charcoal fire or a barbecue or a braai, trying to keep themselves warm. We said this is not possible. Now Mark, in his version, writing, has the chief priests, the elders, and the doctors of the law already assembled waiting for Jesus to appear. And it says that the chief priests and the whole council try to find some evidence against Jesus to warrant a death penalty. But the statements that were given did not tally or they weren't the same. Some stood up and gave false evidence to the effect that said, we heard Jesus say, I will pull down the temple made with human hands and in three days I will build another made with human hands. But even at that point, the evidence did not agree. So this is what we read about in Mark chapter 14, verse 55 to 59. So in this version, it is interesting to note that while John acknowledges that Jesus said, destroy the temple and in three days I will raise it up again, but the temple he was talking about was his body that we find in John chapter 2, verse 19 to 21. Mark says in his version, they gave false evidence. So I need you to grasp this. In Mark's version, when the people came and they gave false evidence about Jesus, they said, this man said, he will destroy the temple in three days and he will raise it up again. And John says in his version, the exact same thing that the people supposedly said. But in John says, he wasn't speaking of the temple, he's speaking about his body. Mark says, this is false evidence. So nothing like having a dividing voice. John is saying, this is actually what Jesus said, and he was actually physically talking about his body. Mark says, this is nonsense, this is false evidence. So one of them is right, one of them is wrong. One of them is making it up, one of them is actually recording what was written there. So let's continue and see what happens next in the story. Then the high priest questioned Jesus and asked him directly and said, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of God and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priests tore their robes and said, Need we even listen to anything further from this witness? You have heard his blasphemy right now. What is your opinion? The judgment that they made was unanimous, and he was found guilty, and that he should be put to death. Some began to spit on him, some of them blindfolded him, some of them struck him with their fists, and cried out to him while he was blindfolded, prophesy! And the high priest and the men that were there hit him and gave him blows. This is what we find Matthew chapter 26, verse 60 to 65, basically saying. So it's almost word for word what they say, but I'm summarizing maybe one or two parts of it. But generally, I have not tried to misquote. I'm telling you exactly how you will find it in the pages of the Bible. So this is the scene that we have so far. Now, in Mark chapter 14, verse 72, it says, In the meantime, Peter was recognized three times. And three times he denied knowing who Jesus was. And having realized that Jesus had already forewarned Peter, then he burst out into tears. So in Mark chapter 14, verse 72, Jesus had said to Peter before in the story, you will deny me three times. And three times you will say to people, you don't know who I am. And so this eventually happens. So while Peter is sitting outside warming himself by the fire, a nice big warm fire. Three times people say, but aren't you a friend of Jesus? And three times he says, I don't even know who you're talking about. I don't know who Jesus is. And after three times when he realizes that he's done it for the third time, he suddenly remembers the warning that Jesus gave him and he bursts into tears and he cries out. Now, Matthew thinks this happened before Jesus was even taken to trial. So in Matthew's version, basically the story goes like this. Then morning came. The chief priests and the elders of the nation met in a conference with a plan to put Jesus to death. And they put him in chains and led him away to hand him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. And this is what we read in Matthew chapter 27, verse 1 and 2. He does not mention the trial of the high priest or even going to the high priest's house. So in this version, Luke basically uses the same idea. Luke 
is of the same view as Matthew, but he provides some details which are different from Mark's account. And we find him saying, tell us, they said, are you the Messiah? And Jesus says to him, if I tell you, he replied, you will not believe me. And if I ask you a question, you will not answer by Almighty God. And so the people, those who were accusing him, said, Are you the Son of God then? And then he said to them, and he replied to them simply, It is as you say I am. So this is what we find in Mark's accounts. Very different. Some versions will say, instead of where he says, It is as you say I am, some version will say, It is right, for I am. So we have Jesus, peace be upon him, saying in different versions, different things, when the accusation is made to him. They say, the people who are listening there, and they hear him say, it is as you say I am. They said, do we need to listen any further to his witness? You heard it yourselves from his own lips. With it, you heard him say that he is a God, or he is the Messiah. And so the assembly that was there rose up, and they brought him forth to Pilate. And so this is the story that we've got so far in Luke chapter 22, verse 67 onwards. And then we have John, who must have, of course, his own version, notwithstanding that Jesus has been brought to the father-in-law of the high priest and has not yet been before the high priest himself, because in his version, the whole event is different. He makes the high priest question Jesus about his disciples and about what Jesus was teaching. So in his version, he has Jesus replying, I have spoken openly to all the world. I have always taught in the synagogues. I have taught in the temples where all the Jews were congregated. I have said nothing in secret and asked the people that were accusing him, why do you even question me? So we have Jesus in his version making these claims that he's done everything openly. He's done everything boldly. He's never hidden away. Yet we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where Jesus went by night, he went quietly, he went away in case the people saw him. We see all this where John's is absolutely the opposite to that. And then he continues in John's version by saying, ask what you want of me because I have told you straightforward every single time I have met you. And when he said this, one of the policemen who was listening to Jesus speaking so insolently because in John's version he's very saucy or very open, very forward in the way he speaks. One of the policemen who was standing next to him struck him on the face exclaiming, is this the way that you answer the high priest? Because in John's version he's been insolent. So Jesus replies to the person who's just hit him, if I spoke amiss, state what I have spoken amiss, state what I have said wrong, give your evidence, for I have spoken well, how can you hit me? And this is what we find in John chapter 18, verse 19 to 23. Very different from what we hear in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A far more aggressive, far more brave, far more open. He's not the one standing there with his head down as depicted in many of the forms and many of the documentaries that have been done on the life of Jesus, whether they pro or con him. So in the next verse, in verse 24, it states, So the man sent him bound to the high priest. So they bind Jesus and they send him off to the high priest. And it's interesting that of the four Gospels, how all of them differ on the number of details of such an important event held in the presence of so many people. Now, we must understand that when the Gospel writers were writing this, they had to have somebody witness to all this. Because who's recording all this information again? We have to ask ourselves, who's the spy who's spying out all this has happened? Remember the other disciple who is John, and you've got Peter, but they're nowhere near. They are out in the courtyard warming themselves around a little charcoal fire, or as the other writers say, a big fire. But they're not anywhere near this. So who is seeing all this information? Who's recording this information? We do not know. It's the secret that has gone to the grave. Nobody knows who actually saw this. Well, next week we will continue from where we left off. And inshallah, make sure you tune in again. So for me, Arif Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.